There's been a lot of talk about shipping over the last week or so, and not all of it very positive, so I thought I'd say a few words in defense of this time-honored practice. And since the fandom I talk about the most is Star Trek, I think you see where I'm going with this. One of the most illuminating things about making these videos over the past several years and getting to meet and interact with so many of my fellow Star Trek fans as a result has been realizing the ways in which my fandom differs from that of many other people. I'll give you an example. I'm not really a shipper. Unless I feel like an attraction between characters or sexual tension or something like that is actually a purposeful part of the show, I don't really think in those terms. Obviously, a lot of other fans do, and that's great. Shipping characters can animate discussions within the fan community, keeping the fandom alive and creative, and giving fans like me who aren't naturally prone to that sort of thing, the opportunity to see familiar characters in new and potentially interesting ways. Shipping characters is often the basis of fan fiction, and I think we can all agree that while the internet has been the home to many unholy abominations defiling our popular culture over the years, fanfic has never done us wrong. Almost never. I said almost, for fuck's sake. Many of the most popular ships among Star Trek fans are same-sex couples. There are plenty of hetero ships that have captured the imaginations of Star Trek fans over the years, too, but since this video is being released during Pride Month, I'm going to focus on the same-sex ships. The popularity of queer ships among Star Trek fans isn't surprising. I'm hetero and a dipshit. The two aren't necessarily related, but are often concurrent. And I also don't have any kinks to speak of. Oh, yeah. But even I've noticed the lack of same-sex romance in Star Trek over the years. It wasn't until Star Trek Discovery debuted in 2017 that we got openly gay characters as a part of the regular cast. So naturally, some fans who wanted more representation in that area decided to find it for themselves. And they didn't wait very long. The most well-known ship in Star Trek dates to the early days of the franchise and has been an important and influential piece of fan culture for decades. I'm referring, of course, to Spurk. Oh yeah, I'm going to use the portmanteau names for all the ships I talk about in this video. Get ready for that. Spurk, Spock and Kirk. The Ur ship, the prototype, the ship that launched every ship to follow. The shipping of Kirk and Spock has been a part of Trek fandom for so long now that we all just kind of take it for granted. But even if we ignore that and consider only what we see on screen in the TV series and films, it's obvious why this particular pairing is so popular. If I were gay, or even if I were a slightly less oblivious and sheltered hetero person, I probably wouldn't need any prompting to look at the obviously close but sometimes tempestuous relationship Kirk has with Spock and think, yeah, that must be his boyfriend. Like all the other ships I'm going to be talking about in this video, Kirk and Spock are never officially a couple. Spurk is fanon, not canon, but that doesn't mean it's completely detached from what we see in the show. Spurk shippers can point to a good deal of on-screen evidence to justify this pairing. For just one example, let's take a look at what just so happens to be my favorite episode of Star Trek The Original Series, A Mock Time. At first glance, someone might look at this episode and say, but wait, Steve, isn't this the episode which establishes that Spock isn't into dudes, since the whole story is about how he needs to get home to have sex with his lady fiancé? Doesn't this episode actually invalidate Spurk? First of all, how dare you? And second, shippers don't settle for the obvious superficial interpretation. Yes, Spock is supposed to return to Vulcan to marry to Pring, but that's Vulcan tradition. That doesn't tell us what's in his heart. We know that he has certain biological urges, and we know that in his own words, he burns, but we don't necessarily know for who. And by the way, 
Even if Spock is attracted to T'Pring, and by extension, women in general, that doesn't preclude him from also being up for it with Kirk. Just as Kirk's famously easy way with the women folk doesn't mean he wouldn't want to grok Spock in the biblical sense. There are sexual orientations that include attraction to multiple genders, you know. And Spock has been shipped with women on the show as well. Spoo Hura was fanon long before the Kelvin Timeline films made it canon. And the series occasionally teased a romance between Spock and Christine Chapel, but yawn, am I right? Anyway, a mock time. Spock is entering the pond far, which means he's got to get to Vulcan and get laid or else he's going to go insane and die. Boy, evolution on Vulcan does not mess around. Except it turns out there is another way to survive the blood fever. If you can't fuck someone, you can kill someone. And that works just as well. That doesn't seem good, but whatever, not what the episode's about. Spock shows up on Vulcan to pring his intended bride, backs out of the wedding, and says, I want Spock to fight instead, and, as part of a master plan to break up with Spock, chooses Kirk to be her champion. So Kirk and Spock have a fight. It's awesome. Kirk fakes his own death, and when Spock thinks he's killed, Kirk the blood fever breaks, and he comes back to his senses. When he gets back to the ship and finds out Kirk is actually still alive, he's visibly overjoyed, and the only thing that keeps him from jumping Kirk's bones right there is the fact that Bones is right there. Or at least, that's one possible interpretation of that scene. Throughout a mock time, we see evidence of the closeness between Kirk and Spock, the intimacy they share, how much they mean to each other. Spock is extremely private about Vulcan stuff. He doesn't want to tell anyone about Pon Far or what it means. The only person he confides in is Kirk. And when Kirk realizes that disobeying orders in order to take Spock to Vulcan could cost him his career, he doesn't hesitate to choose the life of his friend, or should I say friend, over his own well-being. And let's talk about that fight scene. As disturbing as it is, a mock time does establish that... For Ponfar mitigation purposes, violence is the same as sex, which means that when Spock and Kirk are fighting, they may as well be fucking. And when Kirk dies at the end, well, we all know what that means. Anyway, Spock spends the whole episode in dire need of sexual release, which he ultimately achieves through energetic physical activity with Kirk that literally ends with La Petite More. And somehow, there are still people who don't get where the shippers are coming from with this. You know the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And as we all know, drink in this context is a euphemism for acknowledge the homoerotic subtext. There are many other examples of the closeness of Kirk and Spock that could be used to justify why they should be a couple or argue that they actually are. Spurk has never officially been a part of the Star Trek canon, but the creators did wink at it every now and then. My favorite of those winks comes near the end of Star Trek V, when Kirk realizes Spock was firing the disruptors aboard the Bird of Prey that just saved his life and is about to embrace him when Spock stops him and says, Please, Captain, not in front of the Klingons. So we'll just pick this up later then? Cool. Speaking of Star Trek V, it also gives us one of the best moments in arguably the second most popular same-sex ship of classic Trek, Chulu, when Uhura recalls the crew of the Enterprise from shore leave and we see that Chekhov and Sulu took their leave together in the woods. They went camping and got lost. Oh my. Moving now from classic track to next gen, where you can't take two steps off a turbo lift without tripping over a shippable couple. <laughs> Seriously, TNG is a shipper's dream. There's so much acknowledged on-screen smoldering between Riker and Troy and Picard and Crusher and Worf and Skeletor, just fuck and get it over with you two, that it doesn't take much to imagine what else might be going on aboard that love boat. The most popular non-canonical ship on TNG is The Forge, Data and Geordi LaForge. They're best friends, they spend a lot of time together, and in their free time they like to roleplay as the most famous ambiguously gay duo in Western literature. There's not really a single episode of TNG for shippers to point to as the The Forge episode, 
The Data and Geordi ship is rooted in a series of moments sprinkled throughout the series. Because they share expertise in the sciences, they're often seen working together to solve the dilemma of the week. When a shuttlecraft explosion is staged to cover Data's abduction in the most toys, it's Geordi who realizes that Data is still alive because of a minor breach of protocol in Data's last communication. A breach of protocol Geordi knows Data would never have committed because he knows Data so well. He even dreams about him. On the flip side, when it appears that Geordi has died in the episode The Next Phase, Data assumes the responsibility of planning his memorial service, like a best friend, or a surviving spouse. But perhaps the most telling and heartbreaking DeForge moment comes in the great second season episode The Measure of a Man, when it looks like Data has been transferred off of the Enterprise, and the rest of the crew is throwing him a going-away party. Data finds Geordi sitting off by himself. He approaches and asks, is something wrong? And Geordi looks up at him and says, of course there is. You're going away. Ah, oh, wrenching. And they've known each other less than two years at this point. Just friends? I mean, yes, officially, canonically, just friends. But it's not hard to see why some fans have read it another way. As with Spock and Kirk, it's established on screen that Geordi and Data are both interested in women, but that doesn't mean they're exclusively interested in women. And we also know that Data is open-minded and experimental by nature, so if he ever decides to try out a same-sex relationship, who's the first person he's going to ask? What? No. Let him take the training wheels off first before you get him out there trying stunts. Jesus. Anyway, like I said, the Enterprise-D is a ship of ships. Besides the Forge, there's Bev Troy. I think this image is explanation enough of why this one's so popular. Troy Tasha. Deanna, I'm your friend and you tricked me. Only so you'd think about it. Worf Riker. I'm glad nobody pulled a muscle naming that one, though I doubt the same is true for Will and Worf. And of course, Q Card which, judging by the teaser for Season 2 of Star Trek Picard, is getting its own series. Good for you, fellas. Good for you. I'm not going to say anything more about the Picard Q pairing here. I think they kind of deserve their own video, so I'll talk more about them later, maybe next year, after the release of Season 2 of the Picard series, when the good earth is rich and will allow my humble seed to grow into a bountiful harvest. Let's shift our focus now to Deep Space Nine. Like TNG, DS9 has much to offer a fan with a predilection for shipping, but there is a difference, which parallels the differences in tone and approach of the shows themselves. TNG is like a commune where free love thrives in a relaxed, comfortable, no-pressure environment. DS9 is like a key party attended exclusively by coked-up swingers who hate each other. So, slightly different vibe. There are so many ships on Deep Space Nine, and most of them are pretty hostile. There's Quoto, some epic hate sex happening there. Kiridax, they get along, but Kira is hostile to everybody, so... Even O'Brashir feels like there's a good bit of tension there. True, Bashir and O'Brien are best friends, but O'Brien is also Mr. I'm a married man, so I presume him to be the uptight Ennis Del Mar to Julian's freewheeling Jack Twist. But speaking of Julian, he is one half of the greatest of all DS9 ships. In fact, for Trekkies of my generation, it may be the ultimate ship of the entire franchise, surpassing even Spurk. I am referring to what else? Garishir. The Garrick-Bashir pairing is fascinating for several reasons, but I think the most obvious one is simply that the two characters have a lot of chemistry together. Chemistry which can be very easily read as sexual in nature, and which was intended as such on the part of at least one of the actors. These days, I assume most of us know that Andrew Robinson, who plays Garrick, interpreted the character as being sexually attracted to Bashir and played him that way in their early scenes together until the producers caught on and told him to tone it down. But by then it was too late. We already saw it, and you can't put the lube back in the tube. There are great Garrick Bashir moments all through the series, but the big episode for this ship is also the first big Garrick episode of the show, season two's The Wire. 
Garrick reveals that he has an implant in his brain that was originally intended as a pain-killing device to help him withstand torture, but which he's been abusing for the last few years to cope with the pain of his exile from Cardassia. The implant finally breaks down, causing Garrick to suffer intense withdrawal symptoms. Bashir looks after him the whole time, and as he does, Garrick tells him a series of stories about his past, stories which can't all be true, but which all seem to contain fragments of truth that reveal who Garrick really is behind the web of lies he's forever spinning. It's an episode that establishes or reinforces multiple important elements for an enduring ship. Chemistry, the potential for physical and emotional intimacy, trust. Garrick doesn't trust anybody completely, but he seems to trust Bashir more than anyone else on the station, at least, and Bashir knows better than to trust Garrick, but he obviously wants to trust him and wishes he could. A couple of seasons later, we see Garrick and Bashir following the example of Data and Jordy and indulging in some role-playing on the holodeck in the episode Our Man Bashir. It's important to find a partner you can have fun with, don't you think? Especially when an improbable but inevitable malfunction turns your carefree afternoon in the land of make-believe into a harrowing crisis where lives hang in the balance. When the fates of all your friends depend on what you do next, but you still find little moments to share a laugh, that's when you know you found someone truly special. Garishir is notable among Trek fanfic ships for having been embraced so unreservedly by the actors who played the characters, and by some of the producers of Deep Space Nine, albeit after the show was over. Ira Stephen Bear, who was the showrunner for the latter half of Deep Space Nine's run, has spoken of his regret in not fighting harder to make Garrick's sexuality, specifically his attraction to Bashir, an acknowledged part of the show. And both Andrew Robinson, who played Garrick, and Alexander Siddig, who played Bashir, have been supportive of the suggestion that the relationship shared by their characters could have and should have gone beyond being just friends. Last year, Robinson and Siddig even reprised their characters for a pair of fan-written projects presented as live reads performed through Zoom calls that use the closeness of Garrick and Bashir as their foundation. The first, Alone Together, deals with Bashir investigating a mysterious illness that is afflicting Garrick along with the rest of Cardassia. The second, Little Achievements, shows us Bashir and Garrick 20 years after the end of the TV series, as a couple, they've been together for a long time, settled comfortably into middle age with each other. It's funny, and it's sweet, and it's on Alexander Siddig's YouTube channel, as is Alone Together, and if you're a Garishir fan and you haven't watched him yet, I highly recommend it. When it comes to Voyager, there are some popular ships. None of them really stand out to me, but then again, as longtime viewers know, I am not really a Voyager fan. Two of the most talked about are Tuvix, really, that's the name? You monsters, show a little respect. Though, I guess if you are a Tuvok Neelix shipper, Tuvix is like the kinkiest episode of Star Trek ever produced, right? Anyway, the other most talked about Voyager ship I was going to mention is the pairing of Janeway and Seven of Nine, which is apparently usually referred to as J7? Once again, I have to question the creative process that resulted in this name, because the Janeway 7 ship should obviously be named Sevenway. Come on, people, this is the easy shit. I do see the appeal of this one, however. I mean, come on, whatever you call it. It's pretty hot. It's a compliment, Kathy. Star Trek Enterprise fans have their favorite ships, too, of course. One of the most popular is Shrancher, the pairing of Andorian Commander Shran and Captain Jonathan Archer. As with the Odo Quark and Tuvok Neelix pairings, a lot of the appeal of Archer and Shran lies in the inherent intrigue of seeing two people who outwardly hate each other get together. And, of course, Scott Bakula. They don't call him Scotty Bax for nothing. Does anybody other than me call him Scotty Bax? Well, they should. Shippers are among the fans of the current crop of Trek shows as well. On Star Trek Discovery, the first Trek series to have actual acknowledged queer representation among its regular cast, the most obvious fanfic pairing is of the two women who typically operate the forward stations on the bridge, Helm Officer Kayla Detmer and Operations Officer Joanne Awoshikun. The name of this ship is apparently Jola, 
which is ridiculous since the name should obviously be either Kawo or Owomer. Like, come on, am I the only one trying? There's also the ship consisting of Philippa Giorgio and Michael Burnham. This ship is called George Byrne. I will not be taking other suggestions. On Star Trek Picard, there is the ship between Raffi and Seven, which is teased in the final moments of the first season, the name of which is obviously Raffiven. Some folks seem into the idea of Hugh and Elnor, Hugh-nor. And then there's a TNG ship that has enjoyed a revival thanks to the episode Nepenthe, Rikard. Nah, look at him. Can't you picture those two just absolutely going to town on each other? The reason shipping has been a slightly hotter topic than usual lately is because of an interview with Anthony Mackie that was published last week in Variety. Mackie plays Sam Wilson, the former Falcon and now the new Captain America in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. When the subject of the interview turns to the shipping of Sam with Bucky Barnes, the Winter Soldier, Mackie's answer is so strange that the most charitable interpretation is to assume he's somehow misunderstood the question. Quote, so many things are twisted and convoluted. There's so many things that people latch onto with their own devices to make themselves relevant and rational, says Mackie. The idea of two guys being friends and loving each other in 2021 is a problem because of the exploitation of homosexuality. It used to be guys can be friends, we can hang out, and it was cool. You can't do that anymore because something as pure and beautiful as homosexuality has been exploited by people who are trying to rationalize themselves. Bucky and Sam have a relationship where they learn how to accept, appreciate, and love each other. You'd call it a bromance, but it's literally just two guys who have each other's backs. Twisted and convoluted, you say. Like, is he suggesting that the only reason, or even just the main reason, that some fans read more than friendship into Sam and Bucky's relationship is because they want to make themselves feel relevant and rational? That's certainly... a take. Here's the thing. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I don't happen to be a shipper myself, but I don't have a problem with people who are. I get it. And not only do I get it, I think it has value. Why might a fan want to imagine that Sam and Bucky or Kirk and Spock are lovers if that's not explicitly a part of the text? What reason could there be other than the projection, rationalization, and willful self-delusion Anthony Mackie seems to be suggesting? For some fans who enjoy shipping characters into same-sex or polyamorous relationships, it's the lack of actual representation of those things in popular media. Stamets and Culber in Star Trek Discovery are the first openly gay couple in the history of Star Trek. The original series debuted in 1966. Discovery debuted in 2017. Maybe if there were more gay characters in Star Trek, gay fans of Star Trek wouldn't have to read so much into the franchise in order to see themselves in it. I know that this gets said a lot, but it's true. Representation matters. When we create art, when we write books or make movies and TV shows, we aren't just telling stories. We're telling ourselves who we are. People shouldn't be excluded from that shared collective self because of who they are. And if people of a particular orientation or identity have been excluded, they can hardly be blamed for reinterpreting their favorite stories or characters in ways that do include them. But it goes beyond representation to something much more basic. Shipping is an outgrowth of textual analysis. It's a way of interpreting a text in a creative way to find new and interesting and exciting forms of meaning within it. Most popular ships aren't composed of characters randomly thrown together. They're characters that have an established relationship in the text. Kirk and Spock are obviously close friends in the show. We're supposed to notice that. Shippers just interpret that closeness differently. They read the text in another way, and sometimes in doing so, they allow us to discover things, things that are also actually in the text, that we might not have noticed before. And yes, they also bring things to the text that aren't there. They change the text in creative ways. Sometimes they are projecting. 
Sometimes they are altering it to better suit their tastes or to explore personal fantasies involving certain characters, and that's fine too. That's the whole point of fan fiction to blend the fresh with the familiar, to reinterpret, recontextualize, or radically reimagine beloved characters and stories, to tell new stories with familiar characters in established worlds that wouldn't or couldn't be told in officially approved projects. All of these are ways for fans to engage with fictional worlds they love. And yeah, a lot of it does contradict the intentions of the creators of those worlds, but that's okay too. The writers of Deep Space Nine didn't intend for Garrick to be gay. Over the years, they tried like hell to convince us he was hetero. But when Andrew Robinson read the script for his first episode as Garrick, he imagined the character the way he looked on the page. To Andrew Robinson, Garrick was obviously attracted to Bashir, and so that's how he played him. His interpretation of the character differed from the intentions of the creators, but that doesn't make it incorrect. Correct and incorrect aren't the applicable terms. Maybe Garrick does see Bashir as just a friend. Maybe he sees him as more. There is no ultimate right or wrong answer. Kirk and Spock aren't really gay or hetero. They aren't really anything. They're fictional characters. They only exist in the stories we tell about them. When I watch Star Trek, I don't interpret them as gay. I don't assume they're lovers in the off-screen bits of their lives. But I understand why other people might see them that way. And I don't object to it. Why would I? There's a lovely exchange between Bashir and Garrick at the end of Little Achievements, the fanfic play I referenced earlier that was performed last year by Alexander Siddig and Andrew Robinson. Bashir is chatting with Garrick over subspace as he makes his way home aboard a runabout after receiving the coveted Carrington Award. They've just had a little argument, which Garrick has needled Bashir into in order to get him to admit that the most important things in life are the small, everyday things we usually take for granted. Realizing this all of a sudden, Bashir, exasperated, says, Garrick, did you send me away so I'd miss you? And then what, I'd realize exactly how much I love you? You did, didn't you? My God, you're the same as you ever were. To which Garrick replies, oh, we all change. For better or for worse, it is inevitable. Come home to me, my dear. I'll be there soon, Elim, says Bashir. Now, what the hell is so wrong with that? They were never like that with each other in the show, true, but thanks to Almasi, the author of Little Achievements, there is a place where Bashir and Garrick can be together and fulfilled and happy. And thanks to countless other fans, there are thousands more such places for Bashir and Garrick, for Kirk and Spock, for Data and Geordi, for anyone you can imagine. It's a beautiful thing. Thanks for watching, everybody. Don't forget to support the channel, if you can, by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash steveshives or becoming a channel member by clicking the join button down there. Hope you're all having a happy Pride Month, and I'll see you next time.